Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our panel on innovation and in the time of COVID-19. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the R Street Institute and the Engelberg Center on Law and Innovation Law and Policy with New York University Law School. Um, during this COVID-19 pandemic, I think that we've seen technology and particularly innovation policy take a, um, take a number of interesting directions, everything from open source ventilators to 3D printing, and of course, some drug development and vaccine development. So we'd like to talk about some of these developments, how innovation has changed, and um, what lessons we can draw for the future of technology. Uh, we've got a great panel here to talk about these issues. Um, going in alphabetical order, um, well, I'll start with myself. I, my name is Charles Dwan. I am the director of the Technology and Innovation Policy Department at the R3 Institute, where I focus on patents and innovation policy. Um, going in alphabetical order, we have Alicia Gibb, who is the executive director of the Open Source Hardware Association. We have Matthew Lane, who is the executive director of the Coalition Against Patent Abuse and an expert on drug law poli and policy. We have Anna Santos Rutschman, a professor of law at the St. Louis University School of Law. And we have Michael Weinberg, who is the executive director of the Engelberg Center. Um, so, you know, I'd like to I'd like to just um, jump into the topics. Um, let's start off with talking a little bit about vaccine development because I know that that's been something on everybody's mind. Um, Anna, you're obviously the the expert on this topic. Can you tell us a little bit about what the landscape of vaccine development and, um, and policy has looked like over the last couple of weeks? Um, sure. Well, first, thank you very much to um, the uh, R Street Institute and to the Engelberg Center for um, this invitation. It's exciting to be discussing vaccines outside the vaccine context, outside the broader context of um, innovation. So I thought that as a way of um, answering your um, question, first I'll perform a feat of technology by sharing my slides, something I've never um, done before. And second, I'll start by just giving you an idea of what vaccine development does look like if we subtract uh, COVID-19. So how that looks like without a pandemic and how things are um, changing right now for the better and for the worse, I would say. So let me attempt. Um, this and uh, can you see my slides right now? Yes. All right. So just uh, a couple of preliminary things on vaccine um, development, which really under normal circumstances, so quite unlike what we're experiencing right now, is sort of the um, uh, ugly duck of biopharmaceutical uh, innovation. Apart from one or two very popular uh, vaccines um, that make some uh, money. Um, you can see uh, in this um, graphic uh, something I've been mapping for a while. This is the number of vaccine manufacturers in the US, one of the largest vaccine markets um, in the world. Uh, and we went from the golden age of vaccine, so that peak around the 40s, we had over 50 different manufacturers in the US and we get to the single digits in the 90s. Today, I'm not gonna go into the reasons behind that, but that's the landscape um, right now. Um, absent an epidemic like this, you can count on private sector uh, manufacturers to be uh, in the low digits below um, 10. So we've gone from a period in which uh, we really focus strategically on vaccine uh, basic R&D and then vaccine um, development um, to a, a stage uh, in which there's much less involvement from the public sector. I think uh, Matt has something to say about um, that in, in more general terms um, to vaccines being considered some uh, something that's not very attractive from an R&D perspective. Um, um, and I'll say more about this in the relationship um, to patent law in just a second. Um, to give you an idea now in, uh, in the 21st century, uh, vaccines are the tip of um, the graphic here at the, the tip of each one of the columns. Um, this one shows uh, FDA drug approvals uh, for the past two decades or so with 2018 being incomplete. Uh, vaccines are sort of the, I'll call it teal um, at the top. So the uh, dark gray is biologics, which technically is the category vaccines belong to. Um, the light gray, the light blue, I should say, um, is um, new molecules and then vaccines, it's just at very um, tip of the top. Uh, and as you can see, in some years, we don't have new vaccines entering um, the US market. So that was 2004 and 2015. So really, we're talking about something that absent a COVID-19 like uh, event is not particularly um, vibrant as a field of research, even though we have very interesting projects going on um, from a scientific perspective um, all the time. Finally, to put things into perspective from an IP uh, angle, uh, even though you've seen the number of manufacturers sort of plummeting, and even though it's not by any means the 
uh, drugs for which we're, um, or the type of um, products for which we're seeking regulatory uh, approval with the FDA, uh, worldwide, worldwide and also in the US, the number of patent applications uh, and the number of patents granted, uh, patents granted covering vaccine-related technology has gone up exponentially. So as market attrition increased um, and um, as vaccines uh, kept, uh, you know, becoming sort of a peripheral product in biopharmaceutical innovation, the patent culture actually um, thickened uh, around vaccine um, technology. Now, uh, let me briefly sketch out for you how this um, plays out in the particular context of the pandemic. Um, so when we talk, when I talk about IP and uh, patent culture, I mean two things. IP as incentives, so the default mechanism for innovation and the idea that primarily relying on patent-based incentives plus a couple of few other things, such as prizes or grants or, or the like, will hopefully get meaningful levels of um, innovation. That has not been the case, as you can imagine, in the field of uh, vaccines. Most of the vaccine technology we've had so far is relatively simple. It has been relatively simple. Uh, we've had inactivated vaccines. You know, you kill the pathogen, you weaken the pathogen, things like that. Um, those things, uh, particularly in the context of infectious disease um, uh, research, one, if you're relying primarily on patents, you're not going to get a lot of money back. So far, we had not really had a global uh, outbreak like this one. Um, so really, in the aftermath of um, Ebola, uh, a lot of people, a lot of institutions sense that we were lacking an incentives regime other than IP, really, one that has to interact with IP, but something that focused directly on vaccines. Um, so enter CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Innovations. They are a public-private uh, partnership. Um, they are the first public-private partnership that's entirely dedicated to vaccine um, development. And already, uh, the creation of CEPI in 2017 has had some meaningful and, I think, positive um, impact on the current um, outbreak. So they are one of the major funders of uh, vaccine development right now. So we had a big hole um, in the incentives landscape. And one of the positive lessons of the outbreak is that, again, IP uh, fails spectacularly in this particular field and its perspective um, function, uh, but there are some ways of incentivizing uh, innovation. CEPI as a public-private partnership and as, as a large-scale one uh, is demonstrating that that can be done. It's not the end all. It's not, we haven't solved all the incentives problems once the outbreak starts going away, but it's a positive um, sign. Um, and now for the not so positive sign, what I call transactional IP, so emerging uh, IP rights or um, things that we need to use that are protected by patent rights. Again, in this patent uh, intensive culture surrounding vaccines, odds are the emerging products are going to be patented, uh, possibly more than one pat patent covering vaccine technology. Um, this is uh, a statement that you see here uh, saying that there's no guarantee that a corona's vaccine uh, will be affordable. Now, I've been looking extensively for years now since the Ebola and Zika outbreaks uh, at the patent law landscape, uh, and I really find no reason for us to say that the system does not guarantee this. Uh, I think the system has been designed in a way that's balanced enough to guarantee this, uh, but that was too soon. Um, but um, Secretary Azar uh, was uh, very vocal saying that if we guarantee that uh, emerging coronavirus vaccines will be affordable to um, in all indicated populations, there might be chilling effects for um, the pharmaceutical uh, industry. They might not respond um, to an outbreak as they did this, um, this time around. And right now we have over 100 different um, vaccine development projects. That's a very good um, thing, uh, obviously. They are going to start consolidating very quickly. Just this week, the US announced that um, it would consolidate around 14 vaccine R&D um, efforts. So we've temporarily solved um, the incentives problem uh, that's normally um, solved or formally solved through uh, IP. We've gotten past that. That does not mean we will be good proactively. So we have not solved the problem about the next outbreak, which we don't know yet about. And probably we have some vaccine technology that can be adapted for whatever the pathogen um, is uh, we have not solved that. Primarily, we're having transactional IP problems. So as technology moves around and as new things get uh, patented um, right now, and this is not specific to vaccines, but it's very pronounced in the vaccine field. Every time there's an outbreak, we saw this with Ebola, we saw this with Zika, uh, we have trouble guaranteeing um, the affordability of vaccines because of the existence of patent rights and some concerns voiced 
about chilling effects on the pharmaceutical industry should the government uh, or any other mechanism uh, intervene uh, in terms of price controls. So this is um, the core of my presentation. I'm happy to expand on these uh, on any of these points. This is my email if you'd like to get in touch. Uh, with me. And I'll just end by saying that this relates to, I think, a number of the topics we'll be discussing today. Vaccines are specific uh, and, you know, they're very peculiar um, in the way they work economically and even scientifically. But I think we're seeing some of these issues throughout uh, the biopharmaceutical uh, area in, in this outbreak. So I look forward to learning more about, their, about that from your presentations. Thanks, Anna. And that's, a, that's actually a great transition um, because I think that, you know, vaccines are obviously a very important part of this conversation, but, um, you know, the, the, the field of medical treatments has been receiving a lot of attention. Uh, Matt, that's something that I know that you, you spent a lot of time looking into. Um, I wonder if you can give us, um, you can give us some, some more of the picture of what policymakers are looking at in terms, of, in terms of pharmaceutical innovation. What should they be thinking about in terms of pharmaceutical innovation? And particularly, um, Anna mentioned that you know, for, for a long time, patents have kind of dominated the landscape, and do you see that as changing, or do you see that as staying the same? Yeah, so um, let me go ahead and share my screen, too. Okay, so uh, I want to thank R Street and the Engelberg Center for inviting me. I think this is a, an amazing panel and, and a good time for this. Uh, we are in the middle of what I think is a very interesting and robust conversation on what drug policy should be, uh, and it it comes at an interesting time. So um, before I start my presentation, I need to give a disclaimer because I am a lawyer. Uh, so I'm speaking today in my personal capacity. What I say does not necessarily represent the views of my organization, the Coalition Against Patent Abuse, or any of its members. So let me go ahead and dive right in. So um, in the, the outbreak, obviously everyone is paying uh, a lot of attention to drug discovery and what's going on in the drug market. And we're all getting a crash course in how drug discovery works. So drug discovery is a public-private partnership. Um, the public end of that is there's a lot of publicly funded research that goes into uh, basic uh, medical stuff, identifying biological processes that can be targeted with drugs. Uh, this is the foundational research that drug discovery is built on. And then you identify specific molecules or you know, biologics, and then you go in through the clinical trial process and testing, and then that eventually becomes a drug. And this is, you know, a multi-year process. So in the public end of that, the U.S. government through the NIH spends about $41.7 billion on medical research. They are the largest public funder of biomedical research in the world. Uh, there's been a lot of studies on the public's role of this. Uh, all 210 new drugs from 2010 to 2016 were associated with uh, NIH funded research that represented 100 billion of NIH funding. Uh, another study just came out, found that in a decade's worth of um, you know, drug approvals, they found that 25% of the new drugs actually had publicly funded research take a role in the later stage research. So that's the actual identifying of the target drugs and, and clinical trials, stuff like that. Um, on the private side, uh, this is a very expensive industry. Uh, you know, these major drug companies are huge R&D spenders. Uh, the top one in this particular chart uh, shows, I think this is actually from 2015, um, so we have a little bit of lag here, but Roche was the biggest spender with 11 billion. I, I think it's interesting to note that, you know, even with all of the spending in this industry, if you would match the U.S. contribution to this, we would be the number one spender uh, in the world, uh, about four times higher than the top company, or a little under four times, or about as much as the, the top four spenders put together. Um, so uh, that's where we're at. And um, so the drug policy conversation leading up to the pandemic was something that was driven a lot by the access issue of um, how this works. So to give a little bit of context, last at the end of last year, a Gallup poll was conducted of all the industries and they found pharma to be the least popular industry in America with a net positive ranking even below the federal government. It was the only industry below the federal government. And just March, the JAMA Network, which is this major publisher of uh, in a medical journal, they did an issue it was almost entirely dedicated drug prices and articles and editorials 
contained within talked about whether these large pharma companies are making too much money, whether the cost of bringing a drug to market, including failures, were lower than what the industry was telling us it was. And you know, there was a, an editorial on the relentless drug price increases and the problems with affordability. Uh, there's been a number of polling and studies showing that people can't afford to take all their medication, they're skipping doses, and the access issue was a major issue. Uh, cut to March 13, we have a national emergency declared with the coronavirus and the drug industry is the sort of main solution to our problems. Um, so, you know, also I just want to give this chart for context. The U.S. is the highest drug spender per capita in the world. Um, we are that orange line at the top. So where are we at today? There's a robust conversation about how to support the good of the drug industry and reduce the bad in the current model. Now there are twin goals here. Uh, first is we want to encourage a rapid pace of innovation. That's traditionally where patents have come in. Uh, the idea is, is that you provide a guaranteed return and that encourages large outlays in R&D spending. Uh, but the other goal is we need access. Um, we need patients to be able to afford the drugs they are prescribed. And this is especially important when you have a pandemic because access to medicines is a global health issue. Uh, we need everyone to be inoculated and immune in order to build up that herd immunity that's going to stop pockets of the virus from proliferating and maybe mutating. So uh, these issues are even more important today. So what does that mean? It means that today we have a pretty big debate going on about you know, questioning whether certain foundational principles of our system are working, how to do things better, how to tweak things. It's interesting that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to any of this, that we might have different policies suitable for different areas of drug development. So um, here are the things that seem to be staying the same right now. Uh, there is still a tremendous amount of public support for uh, the research in these kinds of uh, treatments and vaccines. So there was nearly 700 million given since the last SARS outbreak towards coronavirus research. And then in the first COVID package, there was 826 million in it for further development of testing, vaccines, and treatments. Uh, this is, you know, an obvious uh, aspect of the system. Public health is a public interest, and it's good that the public is continuing to support this type of research. Um, and in addition to that, it seems like for the currently existing potential treatments out there, we are mainly keeping the traditional drug model. So as an example, remdesivir was just you know, approved as emergency treatment and the best in class treatment for those suffering from coronavirus that are in the hospital. Um, they have patents on this, they have exclusivity over manufacturing. Uh, we don't know what kind of pricing there's going to be because Gilead donated all of its current supply and there's a lot of questions going on about how they're going to price it. But, um, you know, this is all pretty typical for what we see in the drug market. But, you know, even then there's a lot of questions being raised. Uh, just recently we saw uh, Representative Doggett with Schakowsky and, and eight other representatives. They sent a letter to Gilead asking them to disclose the public sources of funding for remdesivir over its life to explain their plans to ramp up production and you know whether or not they're contracting with giant manufacturers um the, just i think yesterday there was an article where people were questioning whether if they couldn't meet the supply um there would be some sort of exercise of margin rights or other rights by governments who would sort of you know force open these patents so that other manufacturers can ramp up the production. Um, these are all questions that are currently being debated that you would not typically see in a normal environment. Uh, and, you know, there's also lots of folks that are conducting studies to try to see if there are better ways of doing things. Um, one study said that uh, it would cost about a dollar a day for, that would cover the cost of production and a reasonable profit. Um, and there was another study that, you know, had that same one dollar a day, but also said that the uh, the the under a different model, the value could be up to forty five hundred dollars per patient. So there's lots of studies questioning what sort of prices are reasonable. Um, 
And then another thing that we seem to be keeping is traditional forms of licensing. The USPTO just put up a database of all the patents related to COVID uh, that were available for license as a way to sort of uh, reduce the frictions that are necessary in licensing those patents and, and using these patents for COVID response. Um, and these things are all pretty normal. But, you know, in addition to this, we have these bigger debates about whether we want major changes in the drug system. So Costa Rica put out a proposal to the World Health Organization that we should put this big patent pool together for all countries uh, working on this uh, so that they can have quick and rapid access without any sort of friction on the intellectual property rights on developing vaccines, producing those vaccines. Uh, there's also been the open COVID pledge that was put together by a few professors and I think have a few tech companies um, that have signed up to it. It basically says if you're using any of our technologies to solve the COVID problem, then you have free access to it. Uh, there's also a lot of questioning going on about whether or not we are demanding the right return on our public investment. Um, so, for example, Senators Chris Van Hall and Rick Scott have the We Paid Act. It digs into this idea that the public, uh, the government pays a lot for this research. Are we getting the right kinds of returns? Should we demand reasonable prices in response or in exchange for these technologies? Uh, and another thing that you know just sort of popped up in part of this is that Gilead sought designation uh, under the Orphan Drug Act for remdesivir. There was a huge backlash to that. And now we're talking about whether the Orphan Drug Act needs to be revisited. Um, so, you know, this is bringing up old issues that are now back in the spotlight. Um, some other important policy issues that are being discussed are you know, what has been brought up before, which is, you know, be, can we meet the production capacity and what role do the governments have in making sure we can scale production? So are we going to let the private market work or are governments going to intervene and start, you know, using various uh, levers they have to, to sort of force open this IP and, and increase manufacturing capacity. Um, and then, you know, another big topic is how are we going to prepare for the next pandemic? What public sort of information and, and transparency measures do we need um, so that we can look at this study and improve our response to the next health crisis? Uh, and then, you know, I think a really interesting topic of conversation has popped up is how are we supporting drug innovation? How are we rewarding innovation? And are patents the best reward for that innovation? So some folks are now talking about putting in a cash prize pool. So instead of getting a manufacturing exclusivity where you are the only one that can make and sell it, what if we just give you a large pot of money as a reward for the innovation and then um, and then allow everyone to make and sell that drug, bringing the price down immediately. Uh, and then there's also a lot of talk about balancing safety, efficacy, and immediacy of these. These are like the right to try conversations, uh, the issues with whether or not drugs are safe, whether they are effective. We see this with the hydrochloroquine in early stages of the remdesivir conversation about whether we should be giving these drugs to the patients now in the hopes that they do something, or do we want to hold off because they might actually do more harm than good? And so um, these are all the big policy questions that, that have arisen thanks to uh, this pandemic. And, um, you know, everyone wants to help and everyone wants to improve things. So uh, that's where a lot of the focus is right now. So I have a all of the uh, sources for this information in my slides, if you want to copy them, just email me. Uh, and that's, that's it for my presentation. All right, thanks, Matt. That was, you know, lot, lots of really, really interesting information. Definitely a lot of things going on. Um, you know, I think one of the most interesting things that we've seen during um, during during the last couple of weeks is the, the degree of grassroots innovation. We've seen people talking about about open source ventilators. We've seen 3D printing come up. Um, people are pulling out their sewing machines and making and making homemade masks. This I think is a, is a sort of different world when it comes to innovation from the one that we normally talk about. Um, and so I'm glad to have Alicia from the Open Source Hardware Association to talk about some of these issues. Um, can, you, can you give us an overview for kind of what open source innovation looks like, particularly in the, um, in the hardware space that you work in? Absolutely. 
So I am the executive director of the Open Source Hardware Association, and um, I'm just going to kind of give a broad overview of what open source hardware is and how it's been, how it's affected the COVID response. Um, so just a really brief timeline, Oshawa did not create open source hardware, um, but we're kind of the organization that um, put the, got the community all together, herded all the cats, um, and and ended up coming up with some standards for open source hardware and uh, ways that people can um, put all those standards, apply those standards to their hardware. Um, so a couple of things that I just wanna point out is that um, CERN has been one of our big backers from the very beginning. Um, they created one of their uh, open hardware licenses in 2011, right after we created um, the open hardware definition. Um, and just this year, they created the 2.0 uh, license for um, for their first license. Um, this year as well, we ha hosted our 10th annual summit, so we've been around for 10 years now. Um, and in 2016, we were invited to the White House to talk about open source hardware uh, through the Office of Science and Technology. So what open source hardware means is that you allow other people to remix, remake, remanufacture, redistribute, resell, and study and learn from your design. Uh, and we consider hardware anything that com is comprised of atoms versus bits. So um, I, I say that it's atoms versus bits rather than anything that it's patentable because um, software can get patents. And so that kind of really muddies the waters on what we mean when we say open source hardware. Um, so we consider anything with atoms versus bits. So that means a vaccine, um, things that have to do with biotech are considered hardware by us. So what is the source? What is the source that you need to open in order to be considered open source hardware? Uh, it's really anything needed for someone to make a copy. So if you have done open source correctly, um, people will be able to copy your hardware. Uh, this sometimes includes schematics, CAD files, code, and firmware, um, but can also include things like hand drawings. So it's not always something that is, you know, uh, electronics based or has software and code along with it. Um, and the source largely is comprised of copyrightable things, more or less. Um, and just for an example, um, this is one of the face shields uh, that was created at the University of Wisconsin. And this was created in one of their maker spaces. And this is the source for that face shield. This source is what Ford is using to create 100,000 face shields a week currently. So that's um, just, I think, one of the success stories in terms of the maker movement um, coming up with ways that we can kind of all share and we're all in this together and we can all make these face shields, no matter if you're Ford or not, they have the capacity to make 100,000, but you can make one or two at your own house. Uh, the benefits of open sourcing, um, you get attribution or citation. Um, so, you know, we, we um, want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and we've um, kind of baked that into the open source hardware definition. Um, so this creates a provenance to your hardware. So you kind of know where the hardware has come from and how it is um, derived from earlier hardware. There's a share alike clause that you can apply so that you can force people to use the same license that you used on, on your hardware. Um, it encourages collaboration and feedback. This isn't always something like it's, it's um, you know, sometimes the, the misnomer is that you get free engineering with open source hardware. It's not always that, but if your project is popular enough, it, you might get free engineering. But at the very least, you seem to always um, get lots of feedback whenever you share your designs and um, source code. There's always somebody who knows how to do something a little bit more efficient or a little bit better or a little bit different or more personalized or whatnot. It really encourages community and that's what we've seen um, from the COVID response with our makers um, is that there's all kinds of people who want to help who are just sitting at home with their 3D printer with their laser cutter with whatever and they really truly just want to be helpful. Um, I think another area that we've seen this in the face of disaster has been um, the Fukushima uh, disaster created a whole network of people who are making their own Geiger counters that were open source Geiger counters. 
Um, and finally, this incentivizes innovation. For businesses, um, this is profitable, and that is why they do open source hardware. It's more profitable um, than getting IP because IP costs a lot of money. And as um, makers are often just one or two people in their own homes, they don't always have the capacity to actually get a patent because it's so expensive. Uh, limitations of the ho source, hardware consists of many parts. Um, and we don't always have control over all the parts. So at Osho, we just ask that you, um, your intention matters on what you produce. So you're only able to produce, um, you know, one part of the hardware. That's the part that you can open source. You cannot open source all the other parts, such as integrated circuits or something that you may not own the IP to. What makes all this tick, um, especially in the current environment? Materials are getting cheaper. Uh, people are finding community. Global markets are becoming accessible, of course, with the internet, also with the internet. Um, networks are defaulting to sharing. Uh, and as we're seeing at times, it's just necessity. We just need a lot of people um, to make these innovations the most efficient they can be. Uh, and as far as, you know, government funding in vaccines and things like this, our government knows how to do this. They do this all the time. Um, point in case is NASA's uh, JPL open source do-it-yourself rover, and I really love the um, the tagline that they've got on this. Describes open source hardware perfectly. It's we provide all the parts, uh, we provide the parts list and the build instructions. You provide the hands, brains, and elbow grease to put it all together. That's what open source is. Um, Ashwa also created a certification platform um, that you can certify your hardware with. It's couched in trademark law. Um, and really the reality of COVID-19 means that people have been certifying um, and open source, open sourcing um, hardware for this uh, disaster. So um, there's a, um, this creator device uh, cre um, completely bags food without human hands touching it and shoots it out the door to the delivery person or to the person who's going to eat the food. Um, and then there's also an open source um, ventilator that's been certified as well. And just to note, the certification only speaks to the IP. Um, it does not um, speak to you know, the quality of the device or FDA approval or anything else like that. Um, there's been a number of maker groups. These are just the first two um, certified projects that have come to us from COVID, but there's a number of groups that are um, helping makers kind of coalesce together. There's Make for COVID. They've um, together created 25,000 units of PPE, and they've gotten over $500,000 in funding. Um, Medtronic has also opened a bit of their licensing, so they haven't open sourced any of their designs, but they recognize the fact that, hey, they need help with lots of brains, right? More heads are better than one. Um, and so they've relaxed some of their limitations to their license so that other people can help them out. Um, and really what I think open source is, is uh, it's, it's really the sharing that you learned about in kindergarten applied to adulthood. So just act more like kindergartners. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of us who have kindergartners at home uh, can appreciate some of the, the, the intricacies of, of, working with, of working with folks and dealing with the, the concepts of sharing. And that was absolutely fascinating. I didn't know about the, uh, the Geiger counters um, in, in Japan after the Second World War. So, um, so I guess, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Can you tie this all together? Um, you know, it seems like we've got all of this sort of innovative potential that we've now discovered. Um, how do we channel that? How do we use that to, to make it the most effective during, during this time and in the future? Yeah, this is, I think, one of the most interesting parts of what's happening is, is seeing all these sort of presentations we've already had about um, how this process works generally, what the normal regulatory barriers are, and then where the open source parts of it comes in. And I, I think, I mean, this is, it, it's crazy to say this, but it's, it's hard to remember a month ago <laughs> when, uh, or, or a month and a half ago, when all of this really started to hit the United States and there was a real concern um, that is still a concern, but it, I think it's evolved slightly, that there was a shortage of all sorts of materials that people feel like they needed right now to respond to the crisis. And so what we saw was a distributed movement of people who were just kind of coming together as individuals and small groups to try and address those concerns. And Alicia touched on a number of them, and they were really looking to fill specific voids that, there were, that were existing in their community, but they were doing it in a way that linked in with those larger global networks that Alicia is talking about. 
And so this was amazing. Um, I think that there were a lot of, there were projects to build uh, PP at home that then got, as we just said, picked up by, by large companies like Ford. Um, there were attempts to design ventilators, attempts to design all sorts of stop gap solutions. There would have been a, been a disruption or a misalignment or a shortage in the supply chain for all of these things. And people came together and said, I think I may be able to find a solution that gets us at a minimum gets us to where those supply chains can realign and potentially can change how we think about this equipment going forward. And so I think this is a really positive example of this kind of distributed open source hardware that that we've been talking about, where you have these groups that come together. Um, at the same time, I think that some of those, those efforts were imperfect um, and they could have really benefited from additional help from, uh, from, the, from the government and additional policy interventions. The two that I think are most important, and then we can get into the, the questions a little bit more, were um, first, a lot of these groups were made up of non-medical professionals, right? They were engineers. And so what they tended to do and, and kind of engineering related people is they address the problems as they understood them to exist and focused on solutions that made sense for them as engineers, but not necessarily that were informed by deep expertise in public health or as medical professionals because they weren't those, they didn't have those skills. And so it would have been incredibly helpful for guidance to come down from the government, not even necessarily as to what they should specifically do, but how they should be prioritizing and what kinds of challenges they should really be focusing on. Because I think at that time, a lot of the groups, they were going full steam ahead, but if they had been given some direction, some of that full steam uh, could have been used a little bit more efficiently. The second thing, and this is related, was people were really trying to figure out what they were and were not allowed to do within the context of federal regulation. I mean, thinking about the FDA in particular, uh, just as a specific example, um, the FDA obviously is set up to interact normally with large medical companies. And so their guidance and their policies were not oriented towards a small groups of people making things, you know, in their basement and online spaces. Now, on some level, you might say, uh, that's right. Uh, we actually don't want people making uh, medical devices in their basements or in, in small groups. But I think at, in that moment, certainly, it was very valuable. And the, the challenge was then out to the FDA to figure out how to communicate to those groups, again, um, what, was, what, could be, what could be potentially safe, what certainly wasn't safe, how they should prioritize things, and what steps they should go through to make sure that when they deliver these things to local health facilities, local hospitals, that they were, they were as safe as they could possibly be, and they were as close as they could be to following the rules uh, when those rules were expressed in ways they could understand. Uh, so there was, a lot, there was a lot going on there, but I think when, from a policy and regulatory perspective, those were the two biggest missed interventions early on and the kind of thing that I would hope to see prepared for the next time we need an intervention like this. Yeah, you know, I think that those are really, really interesting points. Um, and, you know, I'd like to open this up to, to more discussion. Uh, I'd first like to make a note to any of the participants. If you'd like to, um, if you'd like to put a question to any of the, the panelists, um, feel free to use the, uh, the Q&A feature of this webinar. And, you know, if you, if you put it in there, then, you know, I'll, I'll try to read the questions as they come in um, and address them to the panelists. But, you know, the, I think the, the themes that I've noticed are, you know, looking at our, our, our innovation policy and Incentives. We've talked a lot about how patents, um, you know, have, have been sort of like the primary model, but now we're looking at different sorts of ways of doing things, using public funding, um, using, using prizes or patent buyouts, other sorts of strategies. Um, and we've also, we've also talked about, you know, how is the regulatory environment changing since we have these sorts of consumer innovators who are now potentially, um, you know, not, not interacting with government oversight or um, sort, of, sort of public health directions in the same way that, you know, you could deal with a small group of, of large companies. Um, what, do, what, what should people be thinking about these days um, on, on those two axes? Um, I don't know if any of you particularly want to, want to go first. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, um, and uh, since, since you went first, how, how do, you have, do you have thoughts on these? <laughs> Anna, you're still on mute. Um, several of us mentioned the next pandemic, the next outbreak, and, and 
an important thing is that it doesn't have to be a pandemic for us to mobilize, you know, in many of the positive ways we've mobilized around tech development right now. Um, I think that some of the solutions, some of the innovative solutions we're seeing both on the legal front and just, you know, grassroots uh, organization from a, a tech um, development perspective, um, those are value, very valuable lessons in the short term. But really, I think at some point, some of us need to start thinking about the next pandemic and what some of the solutions we're adopting right now are just, you know, uh, even without considering, uh, the policy angles as we adopt these solutions, what will transfer well into not the next outbreak, but the preparedness um, stage. So we talk about pledges and patent donations and, you know, a number of things that normally uh, are not deployed as widely in not just in vaccine innovation, but all the things we need to prepare for uh, an outbreak. And my guess is that some of the lessons are valuable. So when I mentioned the formation of public private partnerships in a slightly different way uh, from what we normally see. So a group that's, um, that comes together ad hoc to think about say vaccine development, I think some of these solutions will endure. Now a patent pledge on the other hand, much as I would like to see one that's a permanent fixture of our innovation regime and says anything that you conceivably might need for pandemic preparedness ought to fall under this umbrella, from a political economy perspective, if nothing else, I don't see this as, as a long-term solution. So I think it's it's also time right now as we worry about uh, imminent challenges to begin thinking about what preparedness ought to look like um, literally next year when we hopefully, you know, um, get to a lower um, stage of the curve and we start anticipating uh, what needs to be done legally and policy-wise uh, to increase preparedness. So we have fewer problems to contend with when the next COVID-19 uh, hits. Uh, Alicia, what do you think would be the, the most important kind of policy next steps to try to encourage more of these open source developers to, uh, to engage in public health problems and kind of the big picture issues that Mike was talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's a moonshot, but I would really love to see the USPTO um, somehow recognize open source hardware because there's just too many innovators that patents just do not work for. The entire system does not work for. Um, it's too expensive, it's too cumbersome, it's too slow. Innovation moves a lot faster than the patent market does and some people just don't wanna be burdened by that. Um, so I think another um, way that people can um, be incentivized to um, have some kind of IP, cause you know, open source hardware is, um, is intellectual property. It's not just putting it in the public domain. So it does have some protections to it. So I think having, um, having it larger groups and entities really recognizing open source hardware um, would be fantastic. And, and similarly, you know, we're talking about public funding in terms of vaccines and things like that, but there's all kinds of public funding in academia and in grants and, and, and other places that I think also need to be reformed and apply a really public thinking kind of way of this. And, and I think this comes kind of from my, my public librarian background, but um, I want to see things that are publicly funded really truly available to the public. That innovation should be the public's, we've paid for it. It should belong to all of us, not just a company that's raking in billions of dollars. Yeah, Matt, and I know that that's something that you've looked at a lot um, in terms of some of the public funding for the, for the medical research and, and drug treatments. Um, do you see similarities there? Yeah, I think that this is a major area of conversation right now, and it's one that you know some lawmakers are are leading. And it's it's an interesting question. It's um, you know the public is funding these you know huge investment in these kinds of research, a lot of research that really needs public funding because there's not enough incentive in the private market to do the research. You know, think about drugs that we want to have but don't want to use, like antibiotics. Um, so. Uh, the question is, is what the what is the appropriate return for a public government that is investing in this? Is it you know to sell the patent and get a cash um, you know payment for that, or is it to you know, make conditions on the transfer that it has to be a reasonable price? And that's the question that I think that uh, Senators Van Hollen and Rick Scott are, are addressing in the Repaid Act, uh, which I would recommend anyone to go look at. So curious about where this conversation is heading.
Yeah, I think that, you know, it's, um, there, there's definitely a lot of legislation that um, people are looking at these days to try to address some of these issues. I guess, uh, Mike, you know, ha having sort of the overview of innovation policy in a number of different areas, what do you think are the, the main things that, that lawmakers should be looking at? I know you mentioned some of the regulatory issues as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing, one thing I worry about is our regulatory responses that, that skip over the first kind of six or eight weeks of the um, of, of, of a crisis, right? Um, and so, and this is also true from a legislative standpoint, right? Thinking about who you, inter you interact with. Uh, what we're seeing right now with a lot of the more distributed design uh, responses to COVID is, as you'd expect, they're starting to come together into larger and more formal groups. And a couple of them are being positioned as the kind of primary interlocutors between various regulatory agencies. And that's great because a lot of those agencies have mechanisms to interact with large, but not kind of medical device companies, but sort of patient groups and things like that. And so they feel like, okay, we have a system that we can slot some of these groups into. And that, that's certainly a good step forward. But I worry that they, one of the lessons that our regulators and legislators will take from that is, okay, we actually have the systems in place to be able to communicate and interact with some of these distributed responses to a crisis. And if they learn that lesson, then they will, they will have missed the fact that it took us, you know, however long, two months to get to the point where those kind of groups can interact with regulators. And in a lot of ways, that's the point where those groups are still really important, but also the more traditional players have been able to retool and refocus. Uh, the, the, the moment of the kind of critical moment of the response is the period between when we recognize that we don't have what we need from those large players and when those large players can realign. And so if I'm a legislator or a regulator and I'm thinking about what to do about the next crisis, right, or the, the next peak, if we see a kind of double wave of this, is what can I do to be really agile and really nimble to get information to those smaller distributed groups who are not going to be able to come and do a meeting with me or, you know, even have a kind of single point person who represents uh, hundreds or thousands of people have a conversation but to know that there are going to be a bunch of independent groups who are excited about helping and have a lot of expertise, but need some sort of governance and some sort of guidance from government to be able to move forward. Um, it's going to be, I think it's going to be increasingly easy to forget about that phase as we move further into this process. And that's going to be the moment where we may really regret forgetting about that phase the next time we see this misalignment between what our existing capacity is and what it turns out our, our needed capacity is. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because, you know, I think that the, the thinking for a long time has been that the sort of front end incentives, um, the, the sort of front end motivation to, you know, get projects done in the right direction have been just sort of fiscal, inc fiscal incentives like patents um, or research grants or things like that. And then, you know, the government will just come in in the back end and just kind of make sure that, that everything is okay. Um, it seems that we need to spend a little more time thinking how to direct those front ends, um, the, those front end developments and channel research into the right place. Um, where you have people who are incentivized by different sorts of motivations than just you know having patents and and making you know making a lot of money. Um, I guess in on the on the drug development side, do we see similar sorts of sorts of needs for um, for trying to channel investment and channeling research into into certain directions um, where you know we might need to explore a different incentive model besides patents? Um, I guess maybe Matt, do you want to do you want to take that up? I, I can kick this one off. I, I do think that um, there is probably not a one size fits all for patents. I mean, uh, the system works until it doesn't. <laughs> and so, I mean, there's a lot of success stories about patents being a good incentive. There's a lot of stories about patents being used to take more than was the intention of Congress and in, in creating a lot of these regulatory structures. Um, and there's a lot of examples of resources not being spent that where it needs to be spent. I think that's why you see a lot of public funding in coronavirus research and in other areas. Um, I do think that there should be conversations on alternative methods like cash prizes. I do think that um, there should be conversations on whether collaborative research instead of uh, you know competitive research 
would produce faster results for some of these things. Um, you know, pandemic time is different than normal drug discovery time, and that's something we're seeing right now. And if I could just jump in, Charles, I think one of the, hopefully one of the lessons of this uh, pandemic is that we talk about drugs or even subcategories of drugs often without proper nuance. I mean, I don't mean in this particular forum, but policymakers uh, and the public in, in general. In my very small field, um, you know, I, I talk about vaccines. One of the lessons of the outbreak is that there's really no such category as vaccines that from a policy and innovation perspective should be treated uh, in, a, in a uniform way. Um, we have the vaccines I was talking about that are relatively easy to develop, and that's why you see these timelines. But something that's specific to COVID-19, we're seeing companies using the outbreak as an opportunity to do work on DNA vaccines. This is something completely new from a technology perspective, from an innovation ecosystem perspective. Um, and the types of incentives that would apply to DNA vaccines if we choose to pursue that route are completely different. It's a platform technology that we will need without an outbreak occurring as well. Um, so I, I see the outbreak as an opportunity for pursuing those discourses. There's, there's a lot of debate on, you know, how technology specific is patent law, even within fields like biotech. Um, and, and I think it's probably the right time for us to begin looking into the characteristics of, you know, the goods we are talking about, because there's, there are unifying threads between all of the things we've been discussing today, and there are um, patent and regulatory responses that share the same shortcomings. But these are wildly different uh, technologies and ultimately patients and public health goals we're trying to accomplish. And I would like to see both the policy response in terms of preparedness and considerations about the patent system or non-patent incentives that are more finely attuned to those differences. And that's something we haven't quite had uh, when you think of all the technology that conceivably we'll need for the next pandemic. And conversely, I think thinking about what technologies really ought to go into the bracket of preparedness and how do they differ from one another and how do we tailor things a little bit better, that should be something that we should be able to talk about, uh, you know, right now or as we prepare for the next pandemic. Yeah, and you mentioned something about, uh, when, we, when we talked previously, you mentioned um, sort of the increased use of, of CRISPR as a technology for, um, for, for research and development. Um, that, that seems like a particularly interesting example of how policy needs to change to adapt to, um, you know, different modes of innovation. Um, Charles, I think I mentioned that when we were geeking out the other day, um, and not on this uh, presentation, but, but that's absolutely right. So I think what we were discussing back then was the fact that CRISPR as, is a regulatory problem. Like, so how do you solve a problem like CRISPR from a regulatory problem? And a lot of people have written on this, but it's also a relatively um, cheap and simple form of technology, meaning as you know, with many of the things we've seen in this pandemic, uh, it's not particularly hard to use um, CRISPR technology at uh, home. So we were talking about the phenomenon of do-it-yourself CRISPR technologies. And one, how do you regulate? Can you even regulate that? Is it advisable? Um, and how do you deal with such phenomena? And this, I think, goes into the debate we've been um, having um, today, which is how do you respond to all these communities which might have very valid concerns from both a public health perspective and an innovation perspective? How do we respond appropriately and timely uh, from a regulatory um, perspective? So I think that that adds definitely to the debate. If I could um, just to build on that, I think that you know one of the things that and Alicia had this in her slide is we saw this open source hardware community come together in part because it got easier and cheaper to uh, deal to to use hardware and design hardware and to build hardware at home. And so very similarly with the, the CRISPR and the bio blocks and the kind of ability to you're not at the point where you kind of if you're at home, you can just like order a, the pieces of a virus and spin it all together, but it's not like a, a crazy thing right now. And so as the, the barrier to entry goes down, there are a lot of knock on effects from that. But one of it is that a smaller group of kind of like an informal group can really make meaningful contributions to an emergency by doing research or thinking about vaccines or thinking about at least designing vaccines. And so um, from a, if I'm a legislator, from a policymaker, if I'm a regulator, understanding that those are players that can have a significant impact and so need to be part of the design when you think about the landscape of options is really important. 
Um, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think that there are, you know, there are at least some people within industry who would say that, you know, those are potentially dangerous developments that, you know, we don't know what, whether these people are going to make something that, that's going to like create some sort of super bug around the world. Um, how, how, do you, how do you respond to that, that sort of concern? Yeah, I mean, look, it is a potentially dangerous development, right? I mean, having, having this power um, within individuals is, means that you can take it in all sorts of different directions. And that makes it all the more important that we have uh, policies and rules and regulations that not only recognize the existence of these technologies, but are also written with an awareness that these people uh, will probably be doing these things. And so to, to regulate that behavior and to provide clear rules as to what people should and shouldn't be doing, and then also making sure that those rules are published and explained and distributed in a way that uh, those communities can actually understand them and can actually respond to them. Because I think, you know, there's always bad actors and it's important to think about how to handle bad actors. But I think one of the things that we've learned over the last couple of weeks and months is there are a lot of good actors. And those good actors are really hungry for a clear rules and for guidance as to what's a good idea and what's not, not like such a good idea. And so if uh, policymakers are able to communicate to them in a way that is easy for those groups to understand, it can be a real force multiplier, but you need to take them seriously and you need to recognize what they will and will not be able to do and what they will and will not be able to internalize. Uh, all right, so we're just about, we're four minutes to the, to the hour, so I wanted to give each of you a chance to give kind of a little closing statements. Um, I guess the prompt I would have for you is, you know, what lessons can we take from um, this COVID-19 crisis and how it's changed innovation? What lessons do we take for the future, especially for times of non-crisis? You know, are there, are there lessons that we can learn about how innovation happens and how policy should interact with that, those sorts of um, new faces of innovation that we're seeing more exposed today? Um, I guess let's go in the same order as we did the opening statement. So Anna, could you, uh, would you like to go first? Um, sure. So I think I would just reiterate the point that I would like us to think about pandemic preparedness before the next COVID. And, and that pretty much entails considering everything we've been discussing uh, so far from, you know, what are the players really in this field, which are not the traditional ones. So just piggybacking on what Michael was uh, saying with regard to CRISPR and other technologies, same thing with 3D printing, right, which is by and large unregulated. Uh, at so many levels and we need guidance. We need guidance before we need to make ventilator parts uh, again or PPP um, and, and the like. So um, I, I, I'm under no illusion that we will have a complete understanding of everything we might need uh, for pandemic preparedness, but I think there's a set of things that we can anticipate with some certainty. And I would like to see, again, a nuanced debate at the policy, at the legislative, um, at the regulatory levels uh, about how to best anticipate the next outbreak and make sure the moment there's a declaration of crisis, of a pandemic, of anything like that, we have the systems in place as opposed to creating, um, you know, our responses on, on the go. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, I don't want to sound like I'm down on patents. I think that patents are an effective tool that we have in the toolbox, but they're not the only tool we have in the toolbox and they have their weaknesses. So I think it would be nice if we come out of this with a, an honest conversation of what other tools we have. I think patents have been overly relied on. Uh, I think there are other ways to reward innovation and encourage innovation and sort of collaborative innovation that might work on faster time. Um, the second person of the patent office doesn't get the patent. Uh, and all their R&D cost is, you know, lost, basically. So uh, we need to figure out other ways that we can use to do things. And I also think that we need to make sure that we talk more about access being one of our core, um, you know, policy goals. Because as you can see in COVID, access matters a great deal. Thanks. Uh, Alicia? Um, I'll take this from the open source hardware perspective and um, my perspective on open source hardware is it, it empowers exploration and personalization and really invention. So I think um, if we can take, like Michael kind of said, take that more seriously, recognize that open sourcing your hardware is an incentive to a lot of people out there, I think we'd be in a better place. Great, thanks. And Mike? Yeah, let me uh, take that thread of taking things seriously and, and say, I hope that we take both 
distributed design and distributed manufacture more seriously and incorporate the existence of it into our policy thinking because I think we've learned that it is a real tool that exists and that can be very powerful. And so as policymakers, we need to think about it and incorporate it into our planning. All right, wonderful. You know, thanks for, thanks for all of your thoughts. This was an absolutely fascinating discussion and I've learned a lot from it. I hope that everyone else on the call has as well. Um, we should have all of these slides put up um, as well as a video of this presentation put up if you'd like to share it. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, um, feel free to, to email me or any of the panelists. Um, we certainly look forward to continuing this discussion in, um, in any number of forums. Um, thanks again for joining. Thank, Thank you, you for hosting. <laughs>